Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. So what, do, what are we looking at here? Okay, we're looking here at a Bristol uh, gun turret. Yes. In, uh, as fitted to the Avro Anson. The voice of Mr Cliff Robinson there, long-time member of the Queensland Air Museum, including 11 years as QAM president. Hello and welcome to Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. I'm Gary Hills, a QAM volunteer, and I'll be your host for this episode about salvages and restorations. Now, I travelled recently to meet with Cliff, and he took me into the garage under his high-set Brisbane home, where he has components that he is restoring from an Avro Anson, notably a gun turret and machine gun mount. Now, this particular uh, Bristol gun turret used uh, twin uh, Vickers. Yes. Could be Vickers K-type or it could be the later Brownings. And the, uh, the ammunition feed was up into here, through the, the gun, down the spout, and into these uh, bins, canisters bins or down bins the down here. You can see that this one's aimed very much high. It happens to be stuck there. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that's one I decided not to try and get apart because it would wreck something. So for our listeners, I mean, there's, there's, there's what looks very much like a bicycle, a bicycle saddle. Yes. definitely the right... Yes, uh, and that's leather. And then there are two even almost handlebars well, to hold on to. Well, handlebars because they give you control. Uh, first of all, you've got the this pedals down there. Pedals, yep. They unlock it so it can be swung from side to side. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it can be jacked up on the hydraulic rams here so that, at the moment, this is pointing very much at the sky, um, but it can go all the way down uh, to around round about horizontal. Okay. I haven't got uh, replica guns to put in this. At this point in time, I'm planning at the moment that we'll make wooden ones. Yeah which also gets us past the problem of having to add them to our licences. Yes. <laughs> now, after a brief inspection of these items, and there are photographs if you'd like to have a look at what we're talking about, you can find them at the Mac One Hangar on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, just search for Mac One Hanger and uh, apply to enter that group, and we'll happily welcome you in there. And that's where we show photographs and videos and uh, commentary on each episode. So after we looked at these things, Cliff and I then sat down to talk. The reason for my visit was to hear something of the story of the QAM salvages, and there have been many. Where do these amazing airframes and engines and components on display at QAM come from? And how do we obtain them? Well, some are donated, some are purchased, and some are salvaged. And therein, dear listener, lie some fascinating tales. Some that we will return to in future episodes. But one of them, the salvage of an Avro Anson frame from a rural property near Charleville in Queensland, you are about to hear. Cliff is a Queenslander, born in Brisbane. He trained to be a pilot in the late 1950s with the specific aim of serving with MAF, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship, an interdenominational body dedicated to providing air transportation for Christian missionaries into rural and remote stations in Australia and around the world. Cliff then served for 30 years as Queensland Secretary of MAF, travelling extensively and deputising for them. After that, he joined the all-volunteer QAM 
and became a long-serving office bearer, including 11 years as president and then as QAM chaplain. Cliff and another volunteer, David Bussey, and some others, have been on many trips, by road and by air, all over Australia, as well as Singapore, to salvage various aircraft and components which are now part of the QAM collection. I'll let Cliff begin by describing the Anson, what I would describe as a rather handsome twin-engine propeller-driven aircraft that played a very large role in aviation, notably in our case in Australian aviation history, particularly during the Second World War and immediately after. Now, the Anson was an aircraft which was used in the very early parts of the war for patrol in out of Britain, over around the seas surrounding it. But subsequently, it was mostly used as a trainer, and it could be used as a trainer for multi-engine pilots, yep. for navigators, for gunners, yes, uh, for radio operators, all, I suppose, bomb aimers, yes. all of those things. Yes, yes. There are quite a number of Ansons in various stages of restoration around Australia. Are there any that are airworthy? Well, the only one that was was in uh, a museum that was started down uh, on the border of New South Wales and Victoria and folded up and that particular one was sold to New Zealand where it uh, has continued to fly. Wow. So it does fly. Okay. Mm. There wouldn't be many in the world flying now, I suppose. No, not at all. And the only reason really that it's flying is the fact that it's uh, one of the later models which had metal wings, Uh not wooden wings. Uh The reason that Anson's... The significant reason that Anson's were taken out of the sky was because the glue was letting go in the wings and that could be very awkward. (laughs) (laughs) We have two Anson's or two Anson frames. One of them is on the front wall, high up on the front wall of Hangar 2. That's right. And uh, that is the one that uh, I'll talk about the recovery of. Yes, yes. The one, however, that is at David Bussey's house over here at Mistleton uh, is one that uh, we obtained that had been cut in half. We've put it back together. David has fitted out the whole of the fuselage, Mm. uh, not covered at this point of time. It's just sitting under his house. And uh, I've built... I've built wing spars for it you have to appreciate that the fuselage is tubular with fabric covering the wings and tail plane are timber Uh and sheeted in um, very very light uh, single ply and how if i could just ask a personal question how do you come to know how to do these these tasks well i suppose i basically i was trained as an engineer Uh, i was a pilot for a while privately and some of this you do your own research you do your own experimentation and you you basically learn the things you hadn't already learned by doing them i suppose that's right you know it's fascinating to me to watch the dedication effort and sometimes sheer innovation that goes into restoring often very old and sometimes very rare aircraft Cliff mentioned the mock-up machine guns made out of timber and our licence. Now, of course, as I'm sure you'd appreciate, even decommissioned firearms and weapons, held even in a museum collection, have to be certified as safe after inspection and they must be licensed and insured. Now, at this point, we began discussing the salvage operation that led to the acquisition of our Anson airframe. Well, thank you so much, Cliff, for sitting down and talking to me today. So just talk me through 
how it goes, how you find the aircraft, how you retrieve them, what you do with them, do you do it by yourself, all of these kinds of things. Yes, well, um, how do we find the aircraft? Uh, through various and sundry ways. Uh, many of the older aircraft certainly were lying around in paddocks and uh, it's a case of them being sighted by members who reported them and uh, then following it up to get the ownership of them and then, of course, to get prepared to actually move them. And that involves, usually, dismantling, loading and, uh, and transport and then the whole business of reassembly. But almost inevitably there are areas that are not covered. There are things that aren't on the aircraft mm. and so you've got to go searching for them. So also there's the whole business of running round Australia looking for spare parts in locations far and wide. The Anson uh, came to QAM. There are two of them, in fact, and they came in the very early days of QAM. Now, we'd already had the Canberra. And we had a couple of the Sea Venoms, the Anson, one of which came as a bare frame from down south which had been cut in half and uh, that was acquired from a fellow uh, in Brisbane. But the other one involved a trek out into the far country in uh, southwestern Queensland on a property uh, by the name of Dundee which is... Um, south of the main east-west road. In fact, quite a long way south. <laughs> when uh, we got to know about this aircraft, we realised that this was one of the ones that had been used after the war in New Guinea as transport aircraft, cargo or, or transport. And it had been brought back to Australia at the time when Avro Ansons were taken out of the sky, basically, they, were, uh, they had to be grounded because the glue in the wings particularly, which are wooden wings in many, many layers and, and so on, the glue was, uh, was giving up the ghost and uh, things were starting to come apart. This one basically could have been just wrecked in New Guinea, but it was flown back basically to provide a playhouse for the children of the owner. Uh, and uh, it had stayed on the station. Actually, when it arrived, the undercarriage, well, one side of the undercarriage didn't lower properly, so that when it landed, uh, it ended up dragging one wing on the ground. Uh, it was there for a great number of years, but we learnt about it and uh, made contact with the people who were in fact the new owners of the property and had no particular interest in it. So they uh, ceded it to us and we then had to uh, set up an expedition really to uh, get the thing back. So there were a group of about eight of us that were involved. Uh, two went out with a light truck uh, and headed off first and then uh, a couple more of us went out in a Land Rover and then well, later on we had a semi-trailer uh, brought out, a hired semi-trailer and on the back of it we carried another smaller truck which had a crane mounted on it so that we then had something that we could load the, fru the f fuselage frame onto the semi-trailer yep. in order to send it back. <laughs> so we were there for about a week and wow. this involved us, of course we were carrying all our own supplies uh, and there was water available on the station although there was no station B 
building anymore. It had burnt down previously. So uh, we were faced with the fact, of course, we had uh, only uh, washing facilities with a, a bucket with a bit of water out of the dam until we learnt that um, there was a shower available about 5k away on the property in the middle of the open. And there was a bath there. And of course, this is where uh, artesian water was being pumped into the bath. It ran on then to the to cattle. But um, we were able to make use of this bath and um, head off down there, get nicely clean, and then climb on the back of the truck to come back to our camp, by which time we've stirred up enough dust, we were filthy again. <laughs> so we had to cut the wings off mm. the anson. That is, we cut them outboard of the engines. Yeah. But, of course, we still had the fuselage with the stubs uh, up to the engines. Uh, and we needed to get it down to fuselage only to be able to get it on the truck. So we then had to cut the wing spars between the fuselage and the uh, engines. To do that, it was necessary to, first of all, raise the thing from where it was sitting, which where the undercarriage had gone over centre, and it, it wouldn't just open up. So we had to jack the fuselage and things up until the undercarriage was free enough for us to get the undercarriage scissor action to go in the right direction. Mm. And then once we'd got it over the knuckle, we were able to lower them, lower the wheels and actually lower the fuselage down to the ground where we cut between the engines and the fuselage and then we're in a position to load the semi-trailer and uh, put on it the fuselage frame. We put on the sawn off uh, wing spars and we also put the engines and cowls on mm. and we sent the fuselage off to come back to Brisbane. The others set off gradually to, uh, to come back to Brisbane. And in the point uh, along the way, they found that one of the engine cows had fallen off the semi-trailer and not been noticed, but it was seen by the follow-up mob. Okay. So they, uh, they got the local police uh, and uh, found it and uh, were able to collect that, so that was brought back as well. We're talking the eight, 1990s, 1980s? 19, early 1980s, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the early days of the museum. So that particular uh, Anson went into storage in the, wool, in the old wool sheds uh, down at Eagle Farm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, stayed there for quite a long time. But eventually uh, the space we had uh, available to us, the wool sheds, was required for other things. So that uh, whole of that Anson was then brought and uh, stored at Mitchelton in the home of David Bussey, one of the other men who'd been on the uh, recovery expedition. And were you lucky enough in this team of uh, up to eight men who were working on the salvage to have anyone who had any direct or personal experience with Ansons in uh, in an earlier time? We're, we're all, I suppose, aircraft nuts and all of us were well acquainted with the aircraft type and had certainly been looking up what, whatever references we had so that we knew what we were faced with when we came to do it. So we were carrying the right tools for the dismantling job mm -hmm. and things like that. And I'm just trying to picture this camp. Um, are you all retirees at this point or no. young, young fellows as well? What, well what, tell us who was there. <laughs> well, uh, there were two men who worked for the PMG. They were both uh, very experienced 
engineering type men. Uh, I was in business for myself, uh, having been a pilot at, up to that time, and uh, I was able to uh, leave the business in my wife's hands and um, go and spend a week out there. I think we had one pastor from my church and uh, a couple of other younger blokes, one of whom is a, a, is a um, pharmacist. But you, as you say, you were all aircraft, you say nuts, you were all aircraft enthusiasts, yeah, right. and you must have all been aware of how important this find was, given the importance of the aircraft and how rare it is now. Well, rare, yes, it is rare, in the sense of having one that's complete. Mm. But in fact, there were a lot of, of Ansons around in Australia. I think we had something like 800 of them during the war. And after the war, the majority of them were not used commercially because of the sort of problems that had occurred with these. Yeah. So uh, there were uh, on farms uh, around Australia, there were many Ansons lying around. They were there because the farmers had bought them as a source of bolts and nuts and material. And they were still, in many cases, uh, the remnants of them were still lying around. And in fact, I've done subsequent recoveries of various farms to get particular parts. We also managed to get some parts uh, out of Canada that had been in England, uh, and this helped with the restoration of the tailplanes and the rudders and various and sundry other bits and pieces. So we've now reached the point where <clears throat> the fuselage frame uh, that came to us in two parts was put back together. It's been fitted out with virtually all the internal parts that uh, we could get, and that's just about uh, the major parts within the fuselage. And that is sitting awaiting the opportunity when it can be set up in the museum and the outer fabric covering put on. And at the same time, we have made the wing spars uh, not in timber, in this mm. case, but in aluminium, faced with timber, in order that we've got something we can handle and that's not falling apart as we try to do anything else with it. So when it comes to the, the skin, the fabric for the fuselage, uh, there are obviously more modern alternatives and techniques for, for skinning a, a frame these days, aren't there, with fabric, than there would have been with, with the originals. Do you, how will you go about finding somebody to fabricate that? Well, <clears throat> uh, we have done a number of fabric restorations at the museum okay. and we have up till now had one or two members who had some experience in that. Such members are now even older than they were when they came to the museum and consequently they're probably not in a position to do further restoration but they have tried at least to pass on much of their knowledge to another person. And if the worst came to the worst, I suppose some of us have seen enough and done enough that we would probably have a go at it ourselves. And is it OK if I just say, if there's somebody listening who may have some experience with that or, or uh, an, an interest to get in touch with us because maybe they could help? Yes, yeah, certainly. If somebody had some experience there, we would love to talk to them. And even the fellows that have that are now a bit ancient, uh, are still around to pass on further of their knowledge mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So all of these are, um, are skills that are being lost mm -hmm. and it's very important that mm -hmm. we should try and uh, keep them alive, in, not only for our own purposes, mm -hmm. but conceivably for others as well. So how do you envisage, once the answer that uh, is... 
getting close to the point where it's ready for that. If it was to be relocated to the museum and it was found a place under cover and it would be able to be on display, what's the history of that particular aircraft that a visitor will see? What, what's it going? Is it painted in camouflage? Is it uh, from the European? What's its history? It will be in camouflage and uh, it was used, as I say, as a trainer here. Unfortunately, there is very little likelihood of our being able to take it to the museum in the near future okay. because the museum, A, is full mm. and this Anson does require a great amount of area uh, to be able to set it up. It's 70 foot in wingspan and it's uh, about 45, 50 foot lengths. And unless and until we have more land and another building at least. And of course, as soon as you say another building, there are other aircraft also waiting to go undercover. So... Uh, it's a dilemma, isn't it? I mean, in a way, it's the kind of dilemma you want because you've got more going on than you can cope with. But it is uh, a shame to think that these limitations have, uh, have now started to bite and have probably for many years, I suppose. Yes. And we, had, we have been negotiating for six, seven years at least, trying to get another block of land that is uh, contingent with our block. So you'd say the museum is at a sort of a crossroads or it's reached its limit and, and it really can't do much more in the current circumstances. Yes, that's about it. But we sort of say we're hopeful that with changes to councils uh, it will be possible to revisit all of that. As always, we've tried to keep these episodes to around 30 minutes in length but if you're interested in exploring more information about the Avro Ansons that are held in the QAM collection, even though they're not fully on display, visit the QAM website, qam.com.au, and click on Collections. And there you can read the meticulously researched provenance of these aircraft, and indeed all of the aircraft in our collection, prepared by QAM historian Ron Cuskelly. So that's our first Salvages episode. I hope you found it interesting because another one is planned for season two of the podcast later in 2022. The amazing story of the multiple salvages from Singapore. Thanks for listening. Please rate these episodes and pass the word around so that others can enjoy our podcast also. And come and see us soon at the Queensland Air Museum, Pathfinder Drive, Caloundra right next to the airport. We'd love to see you soon. Bye for now.